So corporations, you know, measure themselves with revenues and profits and total shareholder returns. What are the performance metrics uh, that you have set for Sumpark to achieve by 2025? Right. So when we did an extensive research uh, from 2005 to 2019, we looked at all sectors, including education. And one of the things which stood out is the question you're asking, that the measurement do not exist on what the definition of success is. In corporate world, I was on a quarter on quarter treadmill, right? So either it was a market cap or profitability or revenue, here the definition of success did not exist. So therefore we said that what is our role? The role of, uh, of, the, of the government is to deliver education. Our role is to bring about a catalyst change. And therefore, the only way you can transform an existing system is by bringing in innovation to drive the catalyst change. So we started seeing ourselves as an innovative organization, and that is how design thinking and innovation lab became the center cornerstone of Sampak. You know, there is an issue of scale. Can we bring about systems and processes and scale and demonstrate that this can be implemented at a much larger scale so that people's aspiration move away from one school, 10 school, 100 schools, and into thousands of schools. It's sometimes easier to list out the processes, the checklist. Uh, there's almost intuition uh, in a lot of people that this is what needs to be done. This is how it needs to be done. I think a lot of these things you know, are harder to scale because uh, they don't get followed or the capacity in the system to be able to do even what is clear what needs to be done is so low. Right. So what role do you see of both, you know, systems, I mean, either technological systems or process systems to drive all of this towards a certain behavior that is desired? <laughs> so, so one of the things which uh, I was told when I was moving from HCL to here was that don't work with the government because government has all the trapments of all the long list uh, you shared. And all my life, I have been a sucker for transformation. I get excited uh, with transformation. And the question I ask ourselves is that if the problem doesn't exist, do you really need us? So if you decide to be in the social sector, and especially giving your own money and your time, then you need to get excited with all these problems and accept them as necessary roadblocks. So I am excited of the fact that we can bring about a change if we stop crying about what is not there and start thinking about one change which could transform everything. And in my mind, that change is the enthusiasm in the classroom transaction. So if you can ignite the classroom transaction and make it jump with a humongous amount of excitement and the teacher get excited and the child get excited, then you put the enabling infrastructure and enabling systems and processes for the rest of the government to support that transformation which is happening in the classroom and put the right recognition, put the right reward in place like you would do in a corporate, transact, a corporate transformation, you will succeed. And therefore, if you can create that excitement in the classroom transaction and create it at scale, then the government falls in place. They say, yeah, we want more of it because it will help us win elections. Yeah, I've also found that, you know, intrinsic motivation is there amongst the teachers. Uh, there is latent desire to, you know, actually make uh, each and every one of the students learn. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the support from the system, just uh, the norms, the guidelines sometimes are the ones that are holding back. Vineet, you have famously advertised that your solution costs less than a dollar per child. Um, why the obsession with a number per child as opposed to the return on investment on whatever amount a solution takes? So when we started Sampak Foundation, one thing was very clear that there were lots of initiatives which were happening, which were what I call high touch initiatives and very good, very good initiatives, which were creating a significant impact on the people they were touching. But there, there was a lack of what I call one initiative, which was, I would say, countrywide or a scale initiative. So the choice I made was that instead of a high touch initiative, I'll create a light touch initiative, number one. Now, if I wanted to create a light touch initiative, we took out a number that we will impact two crore children in 200,000 schools. Now, when I looked at my bank balance, because at that particular time, I was very clear that we will do it out of our own money. The $1 came automatically out of it. Okay. 
So we said, okay, so therefore anything which we do has to be within the dollar per child to be able to get us to these two crore children. So that does a counter. And that drove the innovation. The innovation number one was that you have to work with the government. The only way you can incentivize the government is to do a statewide adoption so that you get chief minister's attention. The only way you can get chief minister's attention is to do programs which get votes, whereas where you come to English, where you come to skill building. Then the only way you can do that mass is by using technology. And the only way you can excite the teachers with only two day training rather than a two month training is to bring enabling. That is how Sampak Didi was born. So I think once in design thinking, we are a big house on design thinking, we put the constraint that it is not going to be more than a dollar per child. We could create innovation at scale. Now, I'm not saying this is better than the high touch program. Obviously, that has its own value, but we took a choice. So when we launched our English program, our English program is in form of uh, many innovations, but the biggest innovation is an audio device, which has a Mary Poppins uh, with their Balan voice equivalent, uh, which says good morning children and teaches English through stories, through rhymes, through Bollywood songs and dances. And I was telling my sparks that the change which I want to see is not whether the children learn English or not. I want to see what is the relationship change between the child and the teacher. So when teacher arrived with this kit, the classroom ignited. Suddenly the love the children demonstrated for the teacher was so high that the teacher wanted more and more. So we are one of the rare companies when we go to do teacher training, we have 108, 110, 114% attendance rather than 60, 70% attendance. Then the second thing which happened was that I said we will give lesser number of kids per school than actually is needed. And the reason I wanted to say is, is the demand there? Or are we pushing down something down the throat? And then I went to a school in Chhattisgarh and one in Haryana, which was very interesting. I said, how do you manage it? You have three class and you have one kids. He says, you know, the children used to come very late. And we told the children that any, any uh, child where, the, where there's a hundred percent attendance, uh, the first class to get to 100% attendance gets the kit for that particular day. And now we have, you know, people coming in half an hour early, one hour early because they want to play with Sampadridi for that particular day. So, Vineet, when we think about technology in education, right, uh, the way I think about it is there is a comparative advantage that teachers have uh, where they can love children, where they can instill values, where they can facilitate group projects, where they can, you know, inspire them. And the comparative advantage that technology has, it can be made available on time. You can centralize high quality and disseminate it at large scale without loss of fidelity as you do that. And together, man and machine can achieve a lot more than either of them can alone, right? Uh, but how do you see technology uh, in education, turbocharging, supplementary, complementary? Uh, what role should teacher play? What role should technology play? I think, Pranav, this is a very important question and, and significantly misunderstood. I truly believe that assuming the technology is going to replace the teacher uh, or assuming that just because you have created a, a set of 100 videos or 1000 videos and put them on YouTube, uh, that will solve the education problem or believing that you have created an app and that app is with red and blue color or whatever color it will solve the problem. You've completely missed the point, completely missed the point. If we ask the same questions in education in terms of where does the value for the child gets created, it's get created in the interface of the child and the teacher. So what is the role of catalyst organizations like us to enthuse, encourage, enable the teacher to create the increased value for the child, not to bypass the teacher. So therefore, the kind of technology you use has to enable the teacher. You have to go through the teacher. So like the audio box, in my mind, is a technology. A teaching learning material is a technology. The ability of uh, the teacher to do quick assessment in the class using a mobile phone is a technology. What is learning? The, the knowledge-based education was maybe in my generation or maybe the generation before below that. Today, we are in apl application of that knowledge. Now application of the knowledge can only be happening in a cohort. 
where I apply and my colleague Gita applies somewhere, Savan applies something else and the teacher enables it. That's what it is. So the only way technology will assist education is to go through the teacher to enthuse, encourage, enable the teacher to be able to create learning environment so that people start applying the knowledge. What is a sensible uh, form of technology um, or technologies that you think is relevant? Uh, what are some characteristics that could be useful? In my um, research, uh, you know, I've, I've just coined it ABCDE, but, uh, but a mnemonic, right? One, the fact that it's adaptive to the child's current state. B is uh, based on pedagogy research because we find that a lot of current content is just digitization, right? But the underlying pedagogy isn't as strong. C is contextualized. I mean, we've realized that you do need local language or let's say a familiar language support, uh, as well as the images and the words and the names are things that are, you know, around my neighborhood. Um, D is what is the data driven sort of insights that are coming to make the improvements. And E is, you know, what is evidence uh, that this is working and how is that then influencing, you know, all the other content. But if you could help, you know, share your frameworks or add to this, that'd be great. Right, Pranav, you enter, enter a classroom and you have, you know, one child who doesn't know counting, another child who is, who knows division. It's a multi-grade classroom. So you must understand the job of a teacher is very different. Now, where is that technology? which assists the teacher in that 40 minutes to handle a multi-grade classroom. We have not thought about it. So I think we have to get into the shoes of the teacher and understand what a rural school is, because that is 740,000 rural schools. Understand the difficulty she is facing. There is, there is no toilet, there is no roof, there is no fan, their windows are closed, and it is a multi-grade classroom. And she is teaching and children come, but if when there is work in the field, they don't come. So there's a very high degree of absenteeism. So once we understand that environment and then cater to our solution based on that environment, by all means use technology. Otherwise, it's 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 a complete failure. I'll share an experience where you know we have a personalized adaptive learning software called MindSpark, which we have uh, installed in many several hundred government schools. And the premise is that because every child is at a different learning level, the software adapts to the child's current knowledge state and helps them learn forward. Now we thought that uh, you know. Once this is done, the teachers would also look at the data and then change the lesson plan for the next day. But I think that is a, a bit ambitious because um, what a teacher wants is all the help that is needed uh, for children who are struggling who are behind. But the willingness to, you know, really, and maybe th that's something I need to do better, which is, you know, parse the data to be able to almost create a playlist or a recommendation that, you know, these students, these topics is what, you know, the software has detected is still as a gap that you need to fix. I also see that every new teacher joining the system is obviously tech savvy and wants to do this. But um, I am still struggling with, you know, adoption of technology um, by the majority of the teachers that is there. What am I missing? I mean, what am I doing wrong? What you're saying is MindSpark is finding out that the student learning levels are different. So the question, first question is, in a multi-grade classroom, where learning levels of the children are different, how do I enable the teacher right. to teach? So I created what we call a progress chart. It's a big chart, which we give every year to the child. And there are children name and here are the five English competencies or six English competencies and six math competencies. And then we tell the child to go and tick off the competencies they have been able to achieve. And once that is there, then the chart is on the front of the teacher that these five are still in, you know, hair and these guys are in division, whereas these guys are still in single digit edition. The moment the teacher saw that chart, she started putting them together in cohorts so that the learning impact improved. What we missed is what you had, the ability to be able to put the children in the right cohort. So had you taken, you know, MindSpark in a way and then converted that into a physical asset like a progress chart or equivalent and put that big chart in front of the teacher and saying, today you have come in and this is the class you are trying to teach. Then she will, the moment you recognize, you become uncomfortable. You know, any transformation, uh, Pranav, follows three steps. Number one, identifying the need for change. 
right? Mirror, mirror on the wall, you have a problem after all, right? It's very, very important. Then a vision of tomorrow, second step, which is compelling that I can teach these children. And then micro steps of getting from here to there. The need for change we don't create. We, we give solution to the teacher. First, create the need for change and which is what that progress chart does, right? And that, that way she starts using MindSpark or whatever it is as a teaching learning material for her to drive change. And that is that is what the transformation is all That's about. That's interesting. I like the point on visibility of the problem uh, being almost in your face, right? Without the attribution towards you, like it's not your fault that, you know, the children are at a different level. And the fact that you can do something about that, that agency is something that the teacher still has. Of course, the teacher may use tools that can range from offline paper solutions like uh, teaching guides all the way to, you know, uh, more sophisticated solutions. But just visibility of the problem and the tools and the agency to solve the problem could itself be a huge catalyst.